I'm like Brother Paul. I'm Miss Elaine's husband. <laughs> That's Billy's husband sitting over there. James, the book of James, if you will, chapter 1. God knows what it takes to make you what he wants you to be. And he knows how to get you there. If it takes a phone call or if it takes weeping in the midnight, he knows how. And the strange thing about it is he knows how it's going to end up. Because when he said get in the boat, get in the ship, and go to the other side, he didn't tell you how he's going to get there. He said just go. The Lord laid this on my heart right after Brother Sonny asked me to preach. It scared me to the life out of me. <clears throat> you know, it, you, it's easy to sit in the pew there and look up here, but it's a whole different story to get up here and look out there. <laughs> Ain't it, Brother Harold? <laughs> the book of James, chapter 1. I want to preach this afternoon for a little while on the purifying of a Christian. God knows how to get gold out of the mud and the mire and out of the hills. And that's what he's doing in every one of us. Amen. I don't think there's anybody here that's ever done anything for God or ever will that won't have a time where God has to purify you. Amen. Or he has to get the things out of you that don't look like him and don't act like him. And he's the only one who knows how to do it. Amen. For some it's pretty severe and for some it's not too severe and for some it's terrible. But he knows our frame. He made us. He created us. He knew us before our mother and daddy ever knew us. And he knew how we was going to wind up before it's all, you know, when it's all over. So the road you're on and the road I'm on is exactly the one God put us on. So our business is stay in the road and don't get in the ditch and don't, you know, go somewhere else. But just go where God wants you to go and do what he wants you to do. In the book of James chapter 1, James said, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Wherein you greatly rejoice... Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. But the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. God compares his children to gold. And it's easy to go to the gold markets and to the places and find gold. And, and uh, it's easy to pay a few dollars to find, you know, to get gold that you want to wear around your neck or around your finger or whatever. But the gold that God's talking about is the gold that he gets out of his children. See, it's already in us. He just has to get it out of us. And see, you don't just walk up and get gold. You don't find gold walking on, you know, on the street. You have to be, it has to be dug out of the, out of the hills and out of the mine. It's a lot of trouble to get gold from where it is. And see, what happens when uh, the bulldozers and the miners go into the mine and they go into the hills to get the gold, they, they scoop up the gold out of, out of dirt and it's got rocks and it's got all kind of uh, minerals in it that's not gold. And they take it to the, to the refinery and they just dump it out off of those big old trucks and just dump it. You see, now they strip mine for gold and coal and things like that. So they just pick up what's there and dump it. And as the process goes on and in the mines, it's put on these treadmills and, and it goes down into the, into the refinery and there's a process that's called separation and purification. Uh, part, of the, part of the stuff goes this way and one goes this way and the, the, the uh, dirt and all the stuff that's in there goes in one place and it's separated. There is a separation that's going to come in your life that God's going to see to that will, it's a process 
where God separates you from the things that's not like Him. And there is a process called purification. And when the lumps of uh, gold or whatever it is that's is separated goes into the vat, there's something that happens to it that we don't like. It's put in a big old car in a big old vat and all of a sudden a man throws a switch and there's a blue hot flame that hits the bottom of that vat. And the gold is in the vat. See, it's chunks of ore and chunks of metal in the vat. And the flame hits the bottom of that vat and it begins to get hot. It begins to smolder and smoke begins to come out of it. And after a while, the longer it's in the fire and long as the fire is under it, it's going to just... There's a change comes, and the process is called purification. You see, what's in there is what's been separated from the things that was dug out of the out of the hills and out of the out of the valleys and out of the mines. And now, what has happened? God, by His process of separation, and now He begins a process of purification. See, when you were saved, it was a process of separation. God separated you from the world. He called you from the world. He saved you from the world. He said you are uh, come out of the world, but you're not out of the world. And now the process of purification begins and the heat gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And folks, we just don't like it. And if the ore could talk, if those lumps of gold could talk, they said, get me out of here. It's too hot for me. I don't want it. I can't stand it. Do something. Cool the flame. Do something. Folks, that's the way we are today. When God begins to, a process of purification in us, the flesh don't like it, we don't enjoy it, and I don't guess we're supposed to. But it, it sure is tough on the flesh. It gets rough, and the hotter the flame, the more we want to run, we want to hide, the more we want to get away from it. But folks, I want to tell you something. Stay where the flame is. Stay where the fire is. God began a process in you that's going to do something for you and in you that you can't do yourself. Only God can do. And the reason he's doing it is to get whatever is in you out of you that's not like him. And folks, it's good for you. It don't feel good. We don't like it. We don't enjoy it. And I think if, if you said, boy, I'm enjoying this fire, I'd say something's wrong with you. You fell off of the wagon, folks. Something's wrong with you. Because we just don't like the process God takes us through to make us like Him. I don't like the phone calls at midnight. I don't like the phone calls, especially God. Listen, folks, God is going to do anything is necessary to get out of you what's bad for you. God's not going to take anything out of you that's good. He's going to take whatever's in you that's bad. You see, when the flame hits this ore... Whatever is in the ore, what's wrapped up around the gold, begins to expand and explode and break away, and everything that's not gold comes to the top. See, it comes to the top, but it's a process that goes on on the inside. You see, for where God puts the pressure is in here. It's in here, and it's up here, and it, and it hurts in here. But whatever is in you, in your heart, in your mind, in your life, that is not glorifying God, get ready for the fire. Because he's going to purify you. And when he gets through, when he gets through, when that oil begins to boil, and that pot begins to boil, and it's about half full, and you've, you've seen it on television, you've seen these big vats, this blue hot flame that's underneath that vat, and all of a sudden it begins to liquefy and it begins to stir and to move, and ugly-looking things come to the top of it. Green, slimy-looking things that come up. Man, I didn't know that was in there. It looked like gold to me. I don't know why you put the fire on it. Man, it looked good to me. You see, a lot of times we look good to one another, but the one who knows us knows what's real and what's not. You see, a lot of time in our life, we think we're in good shape. And we, we think we're in, I mean, we're doing all right. I mean, I thought, you know, before I got here, I said, Lord, I, I'm, praise God, I, you know, don't know of anything real bad in my life. And I'm, you know, I come expecting to just chow a while, Brother Harold. <clears throat> Boy, last night I lost mine. I think you and Brother Ron got through with me. I found out there were some things in me that wasn't like the Lord and some things in me that I didn't have any right to shout over. And I hadn't shouted any today either. So it's not getting in. So God's got us in the process of 
getting us to the place where we'll look like him. And see what happens. Here's the man that's operating the vat. He knows. See, he's a, he's a master at his trade. He knows. He knows how hot to make the flame. He knows how, how long to leave the flame under the fire to get the results he wants. And so he's not going to turn it down till he looks over in that vat and sees something going on that he knows has to take place in order to get out of the out of the, the process what he wants. And he's overseeing it and he's looking at it and all of a sudden he turns the flame off. I mean he just turns it off. And the bubbles die down and he looks over in there and he takes a big old ladle and he begins to skim off of the top and just throw to the side and he skims off of the top and he just throws it off to the side and he skims some more off the top, throws it off and all of a sudden he looks over there and a big old grin comes in his face. You know why? You know why he's grinning, folks? He looks over in there and he sees what he wants to see himself. He looked over in that vat. He said, no more fire for a while. <laughs> no more pain for a while. No more suffering for a while. Why? I have accomplished what I have set out to accomplish this season. It says here it's seasonal. What it says for a season. Thank God for seasons. Amen. Thank God we can shout every once in a while. Thank the Lord he turns the flame off every once in a while. Thank the Lord he lets us see daylight every once in a while. Thank God it don't stay midnight. Amen. Praise the Lord for not staying midnight. I don't know, folks, sometimes it's midnight when you walk in the floor and you don't know which way to go. You don't know what to do. And your world is Christ around you. What am I going to do now? And you look at your kids, they're crying. You look at your wife and they're crying and they're looking to you. Yeah. And my wife says, what's God said? I said, nothing. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know. Well, you God's man. What? Yeah, listen, folks, there's sometimes God don't talk to you. There are seasons when God tells you nothing. There are seasons when you go to midnight after midnight, week after week, day after day, month after month, and God says nothing and you don't understand. You know what's happening? He's got you in the vat with the flame turned up and he's just sitting there waiting. Now folks, when he gets you to the place he wants you, he'll turn the fire off and all of a sudden God will talk to you. Oh, thank God for those times. Thank the Lord. When you get up one morning and all of a sudden you look out and the, and the grass looks green and the sky looks blue and the trees are blooming and you say, praise God for springtime. I thought this winter would never get over. I thought God would never turn the flame down. And all of a sudden you look in the mirror and you look different. You feel different. You act different. You talk different. You think different. Why? Because the flame has accomplished what God wanted. He looked down into your life and he said, okay, that's what I wanted. That's the result I wanted. Now, I'll just bless you a little while. A season. <laughs> Amen for a season. Both I thank the Lord for a season. There are three things that God puts us through in order to purify us and make us like Him. The first thing is pressure. Pressure. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, turn with me if you will. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 8, pressure. Let's look at, back at verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That's why the pressure. That's why the pressure. Pressure is applied to a chunk of coal and the longer and the stronger the pressure, the more valuable the diamond. Yeah. Now, folks, let me tell you something. Don't run from the pressure. Yeah. Stay under the pressure. Yeah. Don't ask God to quit till he wants to quit. I have asked him many a time. I'm glad he didn't listen. 
Because when he got ready to release the pressure, when he turned the pressure valve down, I realized for the first time I would have never seen what I saw and would have never been changed like he wanted me had I quit. Had I chunked in the towel. So listen, folks, if you're under the gun and you're under the pressure and you don't understand and God's not talking, don't quit. Stay there a while. Just stay there. It'll be good for you. I mean, it may not feel good. I know it won't feel good. Because listen, folks, when you're in distress and you're about to despair and you think nobody loves you and nobody cares, when your friends turn on you and your best friends turn on you and your, your, your folks you've trusted in and relied on all these years and they've stood by you and you are in a distress, you're between a rock and a hard place and nobody even calls. Nobody comes to see you. Nobody writes you a letter. Nobody comes up and pats you on the back and tells you what a good job you're doing. No thanks. None. And you say, God, nobody cares. And the pressure and the weight gets on you of just daily walking with the Lord. Of just daily, just, Lord, how am I going to get by this day? But somehow you do. And inside you, there's a little voice that won't let you quit. Many times I've rolled down the highway and I said, well, God, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. I, don't, I just can't take any more. I listen, we've suffered, we've done without, and we've done this. And, and sometimes it's like Brother Paul said this morning, he, he hurt me. <laughs> I've been having a pity party. <laughs> but that's the way we are. Amen. But listen, folks, just look at Jesus. Yeah. I thank God he didn't quit. Thank God it didn't stop short of Calvary. Thank God it didn't stop short of dying. Thank God for that. Not only did he die, but thank God he didn't stay in the grave. Thank God he's still living, and if he's living, I can live. Thank God if he can go through that, I can too, because it's Jesus in me, the hope of glory. Now, folks, when I got in the boat, he didn't tell me the circumstance. He just said, you're going, and we're going. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how much pressure you're under. I don't care what you're, what you're thinking. I don't care about your circumstance. I'm not in a mean way. But what I'm saying is, stay there. Don't quit. Don't ask God to turn the flame down. He's doing something for you. The pressure will help you. The Lord revealed, showed me this when I was studying for this message. He showed me a picture. I used to work at ITT in, in Corinth, Mississippi. And I worked in the molding department. They got those big old silver molds made out of pure silver that molds those telephones. And what happens, that big mold comes shut like this and a machine takes that liquid and, and forces it into the mold. And it'll sit there for 30 seconds. And when you pull it apart, there is a mold of that telephone. But see, it took extreme pressure to make what it made. Amen. It was a liquid. What good's a liquid? Not much. But when you put it under pressure and you put it in a mold, you see, God's got a mold for you. Amen. He puts you in a mold and that mold looks exactly like Jesus. Amen. Exactly. And whatever the pressure, whatever the circumstance, whatever the hardship, whatever the bitterness, whatever the distress, it's good for you. Amen. It don't feel good, but it's good for you. Second thing is trials. <laughs> Trials, problems that are sent our way that cause us to pray when we won't pray. Right. Trials that come unexpected. Phone calls about your children that you've prayed for that's away from God, about a husband, about a wife, about grandchildren that's not walking with God. Trials that are unexpected and you're not looking for them. Oh, listen, folks, a lot of times we can take it if we see where we're going. I mean, you know, we've got a plan, we've got it all mapped out, but all of a sudden, disappointment comes, and it don't work out like you thought it ought to. And the, and the results is not what you're looking for. Trials come when you're not looking for. Midnight phone calls that you don't like to get. And you look at some of your children, some when fathers have to go to the jailhouse and bear the son out of jail because he's turned into a criminal. 
and they have to go get their daughters out of uh, bars and all these things that break up mom and daddy's heart trials that we don't like to go through but all of a sudden in the trial the peace of God comes and Psalm 30 comes alive weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning I'll tell you something folks I don't know what trial you're going through it could be sickness it could be sorrow it could be disappointment it could be distress it could be financial it could be personal whatever it is don't quit don't quit don't ask God to quit don't let him don't listen don't beg God to quit don't beg God to turn it down just give you ask him to give you grace to climb that mountain, Brother Sonny. That song means a whole lot to me. Sometimes he don't move the mountains. Sometimes he don't cool the flame for a long time. Sometimes they get so high you can't climb them, you can't go around them, and you can't go under them. They're just there. And it seems like they stay forever. And that you're never going to get over it. That you're never going to have the problem solved that it's never going to get any better. And you look at God, and God, I'm glad God understands. I really am. People won't, but God does. Listen, your best friend won't, but God does. And you get up in the midnight hour, and you get along with God and say, God, I can't take no more. I can't take it anymore. You're going to have to turn the flame down. And God, in His power and His mercy, says nothing. And all of a sudden, in the quietness and the darkness of the night, there's just something comes over you. <laughs> and you can't explain it. All of a sudden, your heart calms down. Your blood pressure goes down. All of a sudden, the tears go away. A smile comes to your face, and you don't know why. But it's like God says, Son, it'll be all right after a while. I know what I'm doing. Just stay with me. Just trust me. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. I know what I'm doing. It'll be all right. Just trust me. It's easy to trust God, folks, when everything's going your way. It's easy to get on and shout on the mountain. But I'll tell you something, folks. You get to know God when you're in the valley. When he's got the flame turned on you and he's purifying you and he's making you like himself and he's doing a work in your life that nobody un, uh, understands and you can't explain it. There's no Listen, I'm convinced there's some things in your life you'll never explain to anybody. It's just God. It's just God. Then the test comes. <laughs> this testing. You know, a lot of times I say, I have learned. You know how you know you've learned something? It's when you say you've learned it and God tests you in your past. A lot of folks say, well, I, I've, I've learned to live by faith when God takes everything you've got and you can't borrow any money and he won't send anybody by with any. You'll find out if you've learned to live by faith. You'll find out. If you've learned, I, listen, Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. He's in jail when he said that. It's easy to say, folks, when you got a pocket full of money and your wife's not sick and all your bills are paid and you got a fine home and you got no problem. It's easy to say it then. But when God puts a test on you and say, Oh, I have learned. And he begins to take things from you. He begins to withdraw himself and his power and his anointing and his love and his mercy and his grace and he begins to back off from you and you pray and then you know God's not within a million miles and you just pray anyhow and you begin to search your life for sin and, and you know we're probably going to find some if you look far enough but when you know you confessed everything you know that it's wrong that God showed you and then nothing changes you'll find out if you pass the test if you've learned I prefer to say I am learning. <laughs> I am learning. <laughs> I am learning. I haven't learned a whole lot in 15 years, but I am learning. I am learning that God is sufficient. I am learning that he's all wise. He knows best. 
I am learning that without Him we can do nothing. Without Him we are nothing. But with Him we can do all things. I am learning that. I haven't learned it, but I am learning. But see, folks, here's the final process. Here's what He's trying to get us to. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. He begins the process. He begins the work in our life the day we got saved. And I thank God that he didn't quit when I wanted him to. I thank the Lord he didn't turn down the flame when I thought he needed to. I thank God that he let me know that it just don't get too bad that he can handle it. I can't handle it, but he can. It just don't get too bad for him. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. When the master that's overseeing the gold process looks down in the vat in your life and in mine this is what he wants to see and folks he's not going to quit on us till this is perfected in us this is the purification process and this is the results of it but the fruit of the spirit is love now folks we have to learn how to love man without God is not able is not capable of loving Before I got saved, I thought I loved my wife and my kids, but I didn't know what I was saying. When I got saved, I found out what love was. And listen, a lot of times we say we love people, but God's going to run them by you till you can say it and mean it from the depths of your heart. Listen, I love everybody. About tomorrow, you'll find out. Maybe tonight. (laughs) You'll find out. God will run somebody by you that's not lovable and you'll see whether you love them or not. Amen. Joy. It's easy to have joy when you can see out ahead of you. But it's very hard to have joy when you see nothing, you hear nothing, and you feel nothing. He just gives you joy. Peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now in chapter 6, verse 9, and I want to close with this. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... We shall reap if we faint not. Now, folks, whatever it is, whatever vat you're in and however high the temperature is, just stay there. Just stay there. God's doing a work in you that you won't never get over if you'll stay there. Just stay there. It'll be worth it all. It'll be worth it all. Brother Sonny.